Well, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our opening hymn. Uh, yes, whatever our opening hymn is. This time. <laughs> Thank you. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come before you in worship. We invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning as we worship you. And may, through this encounter with you, may we be transformed from the inside out. Bless us, sanctify us, we pray to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Thank you guys so much. That was uh, angelic, I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, well, welcome again. Good morning to all of you who are here. Uh, thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, just briefly, we have a little bit of business to attend to. We have uh, several members who are transferring out, uh, some of them closer, some of them further away. but. Uh, this needs to be approved by us. So is there, there's a motion from the board. Is there a second to let these members go? And all those in favor, please say amen. We wish them well on their journey. Uh, before we go on, uh, the, how many of you were at the convocation last week? Some of you? Okay, well, for those of you who weren't there, uh, the conference has provided us with just a little snippet uh, to let everyone know how it went. So, go ahead. I don't think I've ever heard How Great Thou Art sung more beautifully than the Southern California Convocation Choir sang it last Sabbath. Dynamic speakers, fantastic health presenters, thrilling testimonies, and heavenly music by the Mass Choir and the Children's Choir were just some of the highlights of Alive, A Journey to Health and Hope, Southern California's first convocation in over 16 years. From the vantage point of backstage at the Greek Theater, I had the privilege of watching and participating in this day-long event that was all about Southern's vision and mission. Yes, so uh, as I understand it, the offering that was raised last week, which is going to uh, disaster relief, uh, they raised, China, I see you in the back. 15,000, that's right, I wanted to get that right. To the, to the penny, $15,000 they raised last Sabbath. So uh, we're very proud of that. We're also very proud of our Wednesday night program, Koinonia. Um, we've been going for, it was just our fourth week now. I think it's been a blessing. Thank you to those of you who have been coming out. 
In just a minute, I want to invite someone to come up and share what their experience has been, so you don't have to take my word for it. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone that this Wednesday is actually very special because we're beginning our children's program that will run alongside it. So if you've been wanting to come or you know someone who would, but can't because of childcare, we have a children's program. And again, to be very clear, this is more than just childcare. It's more than just babysitting. Uh, Patty and many of our children's leaders have put together a real uh, curriculum that is going to be a blessing to our children. So even if you just have kids who might want to come, maybe you're not interested in coming, uh, but this is really an extension of our children's ministry here at the church every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So I encourage you to come out. And right now I want to invite Lyndon to come forward and share about his experience. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we come here to worship God, to pray, to sing, to hear beautiful music, and, and also to um, listen to sermon and God's word. We also come to fellowship, but the format that we have on Sabbath morning doesn't allow a lot of time for bearing one another's ver um, burdens, for um, praying with each other, and for encouraging each other in our spiritual uh, walk. And this is what we're doing on Wednesday nights um, at 7 o'clock in the chapel. We start with uh, some songs, and then Shane um, gives us uh, a, a very short talk about the, the, the subject that we discuss afterwards. And we break into smaller groups. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the emphasis seems to be on a practical um, application to the Christian walk in our daily life. So for example, this last week we were talking about hope. Um, we've been developing a skill of listening prayer. And I want to share with you my experience yesterday um, listening to God with the idea of hope. I have a chance to be at a place where I walk a labyrinth. It is a kind of a maze trail um, that you follow. And as I was going to the center of the, the labyrinth, I thought about hope. Uh, you know how faith is based um, on um, the stories in the Bible, the stories of the church, fathers and mothers, through our ancestors, and even into our life, how God has led us in the past. But hope is um, based on the future, what we hope that God will do for us. And the main thing, of course, resurrection and the new life that we have. So what is it that God is trying to, sh to share with me, how does that affect the way that I'm gonna live my life? And there were several things that came up in my, as I'm walking my labyrinth. One is, if I really believe in new life, I should not be worried about giving my life to somebody else, should that need to happen. Well, I, that, that, may not, that may not happen where I actually have to give my life, but every day, I give my life to someone else by smiling at them, by paying attention to them, by caring about them. And I realized that there are some priorities that I really needed to shift in my life. As I'm getting to the center of the labyrinth, I just was aware of God's presence um, the fact that God wants to help me. Um, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to be a good father and I'm wanting to be a good husband and I'm wanting to be there for uh, someone else. But I can't be there unless that person accepts and wants me to be there. So I, I, spent a few moments picturing God looking down at me, wanting to take away my pains, 
my sorrows and basking in that. And then as I left the labyrinth, coming back into the world, I was aware of two pitfalls on either side of hope that I wanted to, to avoid. One pitfall is feeling like I'm no good, I have still the same problems that I always had, they don't seem to get any better, so that is the pitfall of despair. On the other hand, it's the pitfall of, of presumption that, oh, God loves me and I'm going to have eternal life. God is going to fix me just now and I don't have to do anything because God has taken care of it. Don't change a thing. I'm great. So between those two pitfalls, I'm still working on it. But as I came out from the labyrinth, I think I was stronger and able to face what I need to face every day. So these are the kinds of things that we share with each other. Sometimes um, we don't feel God like we wish we did. Sometimes we have things to pray, to praise that we're in a great place. So my hope, my hope for each person here is that we will hear God's voice and that we will obey God's voice. If there's anyone here who wants a closer walk with God, who wants a relationship that really makes a difference in their life every single day. If you have time to come and join us on se at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays, we'd be happy to, to um, encourage you and, and we look forward to receiving your encouragement as well. Um, but however God is leading each of us, there are many ways to experience God, and I, my hope is that each person will grow in their faith. Thank you. Good morning, family. Good morning. I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward to collect the offering. The designated offering this week is for the Pacific Union Conference. If you would like to contribute uh, to their budget, if you would mark that on your tithe envelope. Uh, loose offering will go to church budget. I'd like to invite you to take a look at your bulletin under the column that says Church Life down at the bottom. where it says Church Finances, Week 38. Our weekly church budget is $11,452. Received last week, 2,088. How many of you like worshiping here at this church? How many of you feel that God blessed you this last week? And I'll give you a clue about how you know if you were blessed this last week. Did you wake up this morning and realize you're still above ground? As an elder in this church, I attend our board meetings and we have a financial report every board meeting. And I noticed that our tithe giving at this church is spectacular. We're entitled to a lot more pastors than we actually have based on how much tithe we contribute to the conference. But our giving for supporting the ministries and the operation of this facility here is really, really, really shameful. I would encourage you to prayerfully consider making a plan for increasing your giving to support the ministries and functioning of this church family. Will the deacons please collect the offering.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you have blessed us with. We thank you for your love and care for us, and we ask that these monies that have been given this morning will go to your glory to finish the work so that you can come again soon. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, it's time for the children's stories, so come on down. And while they're coming down, I invite you to please stay standing and to turn and find someone to greet and share a little love with. Well, good morning, children. How are you today? I want to ask you a question. How many of you like riddles? What is a riddle? Something that usually rhymes. Yeah, might not, might not rhyme that well. Okay, I want to ask you a riddle. What holds water, even though it's full of holes? That's a very good guess. Let me show you. What is that? A sponge. Yeah, look, it has a whole bunch of holes, but when you get water in it, it keeps the water there. Okay, next riddle. What gets wet when it's drying? Anybody have a guess? When it's drying, it, um, the water gets out. That's very true. Let me show you. When you're drying yourself, the towel gets wet, doesn't it? Is that funny? Okay, last riddle. When, this one might rhyme a little bit. When I am full, I can work all day. I can work and play. But when I'm empty, I do nothing all day. What am I? Anybody have a guess? Stomach? Well, that's a good guess. Let me show you. When the hand is in there, it does things. But when it's empty, it can't do anything. Well, Jesus liked to tell riddles. I want to tell you a story about a time when he was talking to the chief priests and Pharisees, and he told this story, and it's kind of a riddle. You see if you can guess. Well, Jesus said, a man had two sons, and he asked the first son to go work in the garden. And the son said, no, I have other things I want to do. But then he started thinking about it. And he said, well, maybe I should go. So he went. The second son, he asked him, can you go work in the garden for me? And he said, sure, Father, I'll go. 
But then he got tired or he got lazy and he decided not to go. Now the riddle is, which one obeyed his father? The one who said yes, father. Did he actually go? The one who said no. The one who said no and then decided to go. The one who said yes didn't do anything. The one that said yes didn't do it. That's right. Do you ever do that? Do you say, Mommy, I'm going to go and I'm going to clean up my room and then you don't do it? Whoa. That would be a lie. Well, you might not mean it to be a lie. You might mean it. You might say, I'm going to go clean my room, Mom, and then you get in there and you start playing with something that you were going to clean up. Yeah, that happens. But we need to remember that when we say something, we need to do it. Because people count on us to do things that we say we're going to do, right? Okay, remember that. When you say something or make a promise, you need to do it, okay? I would like to dismiss you for Children's Church, ages four and up. Thank you. You may go.
I would like to invite all of you who have a special prayer request to come down while we sing our prayer song, number 671. the last two, two weeks I got many phone calls I got some emails my daughter was in Puerto Rico she still is I didn't hear anything for the days, <laughs> she called on uh, Tuesday, and she said, "Daddy, I'm okay, Amen. and I want to thank you, everybody, for praying for her." She said, "Daddy, I want to go home, <laughs> so she be here." in two weeks as I call the airline and they changed I changed some tickets that I have for her for Christmas and uh, again this church has been wonderful I got some beautiful emails that I forward to her so she can feel the love of God to you guys and also, I would like to tell you one thing. I, I am dialysis. I get up at 4.30 in the morning every other day. And I'm telling you, Wednesday night for me has been a blessing. And I'm tired because I get up a little after 4.30. And after having dialysis, sometimes I don't feel doing anything. But... Wednesday night has been a blessing, and I know if you make an effort to be here, it will be a blessing for every one of you. If you can kneel, we would appreciate you to do that right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this Sabbath morning to tell you how grateful we are for all the wonderful blessings you have given to each one of us. And one of those blessings is Noberto's daughter being able to come home. You are so awesome and loving. As our creator, you daily offer us so much love, mercy, and grace. When you give it freely to us, we just need to accept it into our hearts. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for each one of us, and he was coming back to take us to our heavenly home. What a wonderful promise. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who is here with us at this moment. May we continue to accept his presence in our daily lives. Dear Lord, we pray that you will be with our families, all of our loved ones who need you in their hearts. We pray for our church family, our pastors, those who teach us and lead us to follow Jesus. Be with them and guide them. We pray, Lord, for all those who are suffering from illnesses or sickness, those who've lost their jobs or have lost loved ones, please be with them. We especially pray for those in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, and in the U.S. who have no electricity and they've lost everything. 
Please be with them, dear God, and send their guardian angels close to them. We ask that you will be with our nation and its leaders. Help us all to turn to Jesus Christ every moment of every day to find the peace and the joy we each need. We all must put Jesus first in our lives and renew our characters to be more like him every day. Again, we thank you, dear Heavenly Father, and praise your name and ask all these requests in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. Verses 20, verse 23, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? He said to, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you will tell the, me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argue with one another. If we said from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same thing. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They, they said, the first, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your mind and believe him. Everyone's okay, don't worry. Thank you so much, Barry, for that. Uh, and thank you uh, for everyone who came forward for prayer. Uh, thank you to Noberto for uh, that update. And it's just, it, it's one of those Sabbaths, I, I feel this way quite often, where I feel like a sermon is kind of anticlimactic. I mean, we've had great music, we've prayed together, and now yeah, we have to, this, this is a formality. So let, let's, let's get through this. There's a hike this afternoon, by the way. So we, let's look forward to that. Um, and uh, yes, may God bless us today. So the reading uh, that we just heard uh, from Barry, just prior to that conversation, it's helpful for a little bit of context that just the day before this, uh, Jesus had that infamous scene of going into the temple and overturning the tables and casting out the money changers. So it's now he returns, in effect, to the scene of the crime the next day. And the priests, who are the people who are in charge of the temple, <laughs> ask him quite reasonably, by what authority are you doing these things, right? You come in here as if this is your house. By what authority do you do these things? In other words, the leaders are asking, are you a self-appointed Messiah? Or is your authority from God? Is your power from heaven? Or is it from human origin? That's their question to Jesus. Is your authority from heaven? Or is it, from, is it of human origin? So Jesus turns the question around on them and asks them the same question about John the Baptist. Where did his authority come from? 
Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? You see, Jesus is sharing in the credibility of John the Baptist, who was popular. And Jesus is saying, if you believed in him, then you ought to believe in me as well. Treat us as one and the same. So if you're questioning my authority, then question his authority because they are interconnected. So when Jesus puts this question back at them, they argue amongst themselves. Because if we say, they say to each other, if we say John came from heaven, then he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say he's of human origin, then we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So here Jesus has caught them in their hypocrisy because they don't believe in John the Baptist. They didn't follow his way of repentance, but they're too afraid to admit that because they know that John is popular among the people. So Jesus' question is challenging them to pick a side. You can't play both sides anymore. Either you're with me or you're against me. Jesus says they are excuse me, they're being challenged to come clean of their hypocrisy. If they believe in John, then they need to accept Jesus. If they don't believe in John, they need to be willing to admit that. He's challenging their, their dual identity. They're being good uh, politicians, right? A political answer is an answer that won't offend either side, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to play both sides. So the answer, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. They fail to meet the challenge. They fall back on their ambiguity, their hypocrisy, their politicalness. They try to live this double life. But what God cannot tolerate, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, what God cannot tolerate is hypocrisy. Lukewarmness, we might say. Be one or the other. Be with me or against me. What Jesus cannot tolerate are those who don't practice what they preach. Notice carefully, two chapters from now, in Matthew 23, Jesus says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. Now, this might come as a little bit of a surprise because we think of the Pharisees and the scribes as the bad guys the guys that are always butting heads with Jesus. But Jesus says they sit in Moses' seat. They have Moses' authority. Whatever they tell you to do, do it. Their problem with, Jesus' problem with the Pharisees is not in what they say, but it's the fact that they don't follow what they teach. He adds, do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. The problem with Pharisees is not in what they're saying, it's that they didn't follow through. They didn't practice what they preached. So Jesus compares them to dirty dishes. And this is such a poignant picture. Uh, as a, a, a single guy who lives alone, I know something about dirty dishes, right? Uh, you know, I remember when I first had my own apartment, uh, living alone, um, you know, dishes pile up in the sink. And there was one, it was a Tupperware container. This really sticks in my mind. There's a Tupperware container that had just a little bit of spaghetti sauce in the bottom, on the sides, and it eventually gets covered up with other things until I come time to, you know, clean things out. And that whole container had been filled with this blue-green fuzz. It was just, it was like hair. It was incredible, right? And it's so, it's so disgusting that it's like, you don't even want to get close enough to it to, to, to clean it out, right? It's like, I was afraid of breathing around it. It's horrifying. Uh, yeah, I think I may have thrown it away, exactly. Because here's, here's the problem, right? If you only clean the outside of a dirty dish, it doesn't do any good whatsoever, right? You gotta get down in there and clean the out, clean the inside of the bowl. If all you do is scrub the outside, you haven't cleaned it at all. And so just as a dirty dish, it's 
clean on the outside and dirty on the inside is useless. So Jesus is saying those who say the right things, those who believe the right things, but they don't do the right things, it's equally useless. It's when Jesus tells this story that we heard this morning of a man who has two sons. He says to the first son, son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son says, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. And the father went to the second and said the same and answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. So which of the two did the will of his father? And I urge you this morning to let this parable challenge you. Which of these two sons are you? Are you the one who says, yes, I will obey, but doesn't? If so, what Jesus is pointing out is that your profession of faith, your, your acknowledgement of the truth, your acknowledgement of your responsibility gets you absolutely nowhere. But there are those who have bad theology. There are those who even explicitly deny God, who reject God's law. But Jesus is saying those people are closer to heaven than you are. One month from now, one month from now, October 31st, 2017, will be the 500th anniversary to the day of the Protestant Reformation. It's fascinating. 500 years exactly we're at. And one of Martin Luther's slogans, we all know sola scriptura, the Bible alone, sola gratia, grace alone. He also taught sola fides, by faith alone, justification by faith alone. But isn't it interesting, I'm going to challenge you a little bit and push back this morning against Martin Luther, that the one and only time in Scripture that the expression faith alone occurs is in James chapter 2, verse 24, where the Bible says, You see then that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The one time in the Bible where the expression faith alone is used, the Bible, Jesus' own brother, says your justification is not by faith alone. No wonder then uh, Martin Luther had some problems with the book of James. Now I think it's ironic that Seventh-day Adventists have a reputation uh, among other Protestants and evangelicals to be hung up on works. You knew this, you're familiar with this, that if you read a, a Protestant criticism of Seventh-day Adventism, what you'll often read is that Adventists ha have a hard time accepting justification by faith, that they believe that you're saved through Sabbath-keeping or some kind of works, some kind of righteousness by works. But in my opinion, I think it's actually quite the other way around. The Adventism that I have seen growing up, uh, that I've seen all across the country, actually creates a culture where people think that they are saved precisely by what they believe, regardless of what they do. Certainly, I can't be the only one that has a friend or a family member who doesn't really live a Christian lifestyle. Maybe they don't really even make an effort to keep the Sabbath. But they know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. And they will fight to the end uh, to argue that point. And they think that just by knowing that, that that gives them some kind of leg up, right? That that gives them some kind of spiritual advantage. That makes them better than other Christians. Regardless of how they live, they know the truth. You see, Adventists have a tendency toward the heresy of Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? The idea that salvation comes through knowledge. So many of us think that we'll be saved or that salvation is achieved by knowing that the seventh day is the Sabbath or knowing that death is an unconscious state or knowing this information that Jesus moved into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. Knowing for Adventism has often been a point of emphasis. But the parable of Jesus this morning tells us that it is not about what we believe or what we say, it's about what we do. It's about how we live our lives. 
So this morning, I want to take the Sabbath as an example. And let's be clear about this. We're using this as an example of getting at the heart of the matter. We could talk about all kinds of different things, but I want to talk about the Sabbath this morning. Because when we go back to the laws of Moses, we can see very clearly that the Sabbath was introduced as a means of creating economic equality. Weekly Sabbaths allowed for the rest of workers. Yearly Sabbaths accommodated for the feeding of the poor. And the Sabbath of Sabbaths, the year of Jubilee, was the time in which all debts were canceled and all slaves were set free. And even in the Ten Commandments, the, the, the lesser quoted version of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, where God gives the Ten Commandments, it says this, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see, the Sabbath commandment is tied forever with this idea of liberation from slavery because the Sabbath is a safeguard against returning to that brutal form of slavery from which Israel came. It's a safeguard against economic injustice. The Sabbath is a perpetual reminder to look after the poor. So no wonder then, when the Hebrew prophets come along and they see Israel mistreating the poor, they see Israel uh, failing to care for the needy, and so they tell the people of Israel, God hates your Sabbath. Through Amos, God says this, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but... Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And again, through the prophet Isaiah, God says, The Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure it. Your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Why? Why is God so, so, so angry, so uh, detested by their Sabbath keeping. He says, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. You see, if you turn off your TV on Saturdays, if you come to church on Saturday morning and take a nap on Sabbath afternoon, but you don't seek justice, you don't rescue the oppressed, you don't defend the orphan, you don't plead for the widow, then what God is saying is that in his eyes, you're a Sabbath breaker. You're like the son who says to his father, I will go and work in the vineyard, but you don't. On the other hand, those who reject the Sabbath, those who say that every day is the same in God's eyes, that Sabbath keeping is not binding on Christians, but... They care for the homeless. They clothe the naked. They defend the rights of the poor. And they're like the son who says to the father that even though he says he won't go, he has done it anyways. They might be rejecting the letter of the law, but they have understood the spirit of the law. They might say that they won't keep the Sabbath, but they are in fact Sabbath keepers. I encourage you, even this afternoon, to read Isaiah 58. To keep the Sabbath means to loose the bonds of injustice, to set the oppressed free, to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked, to cover them. So may God convict us this morning of our hypocrisy. May we be challenged to no longer rely on what we think we know and that we can uh, prepare for the last days by getting more information or by thinking that what we simply say we believe or that what we teach, that that's what makes us closer to God than anyone else. It's not about what you say. 
It's about what you do. As Christ says to us this morning, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For while the tax collectors and prostitutes may be sinners on the outside, they have no hypocrisy. They trust in God's good news of victory for the poor and justice for the oppressed. So may this morning, may God cleanse us inside and out. May he equip us to serve him in word and in deed. And may we trust in God's promises, not just by our faith, but in our actions. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, your law is a challenge to us. What you have commanded us to do is sometimes difficult. But we pray for your Holy Spirit to change not just our external behaviors, not just to change our minds, but to change our hearts. Take away from us our hypocrisy. May we acknowledge before you with all honesty our guilt, our inadequacy. May we trust only in you to be our Savior and to transform us by your Holy Spirit. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me as we close with our closing hymn, hymn number 518, Standing on the Promises of God. As a final blessing, I want to leave you with the words of Scripture. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. You may be seated.